All right, here we go. Hello and welcome to Explore Classroom. My name is Ashley Holmes on behalf of National Geographic Education. I am so happy to see you all today and welcome you to another Explore Classroom. Ooh. I can hear myself repeating online. Um, at National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration and wonder to change the world. The heart of our National Geographic community is, of course, our National Geographic explorers. Explorers are cutting edge scientists, amazing researchers, and powerful storytellers. These Explorer Classroom events connect students around the world with our National Geographic explorers for short lessons and extended Q&As. We are now hosting Explorer Classroom every weekday at 2 p.m. Eastern time, in addition to the usual events. So if you'd like, we can see you right back here tomorrow. Today, we're very lucky to be connecting with Jennifer Adler. Jenny is a conservation photographer and underwater photojournalist. She's a cave diver and free diver with extensive underwater photography experience. She uses her background in science to inform her imagery and tell visual stories that communicate science and conservation. Today, she is going to share with us her work on sea cows and sponges. But before she does that, I'd like to acknowledge that we're joined on screen by several student groups and we have over 1000 students registered to watch online today. I'm so glad to have so many of you with us today. We have groups joining in from around the US and around the world. It's a long list, so bear with me, but we have students from Canada, France, Ireland, Mexico, Romania, South Africa, Spain, and the United Kingdom, and then in the United States. We have students from Alabama, Alaska, Arizona, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Idaho, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Kentucky, Ant Kentucky, Louisiana, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, Minnesota, Mississippi, Missouri, Nebraska, Nevada, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Texas, Utah, Virginia, Washington, Wisconsin, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and even in Washington, D.C., where our headquarters is located. There are a couple of student groups I also want to give shout outs to. There's Avery Middle School, Brookville Intermediate School, Franklin School, Howard R. Driggs Elementary, Miles Elementary School, Montessori School of Raleigh, Ocean Studies Charter School, Seabury School, Washington Cathway Future Center, and Yuba Environmental Science Charter Academy. That was a lot, and I'm sure I missed a ton of you. So please say hi in the chat bar and let us know where you're watching from. But for now, that's plenty from me. It's finally time to turn things over to Jenny for today's Explore Classroom lesson. All right, take it away, Jenny. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to see everyone here and hi to everyone tuning in on YouTube. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. I think we're good, cool. Jenny. Awesome. Ooh. So you may be hearing my dog. <laughs> you may be hearing um, a lot about masks these days. So one of the masks that I have here is um, for a COVID-19 and my grandmother made it. You can see it has fish all over it. And so we would take this and put it on our face if we were going out to shoot a story, right? But the mask that I use in my work that's super important for being underwater is this kind of mask. Um, underwater mask it goes on just like this. And breathe through the snorkel. So if you're snorkeling at the surface, this is what you would use. It's a breathing tube. It kind of fits in your mouth like a mouth guard. If you haven't used one before, you can see it has these pieces here and it just goes around in like this. And then that's how you breathe. You just keep that part above the water. So I want to start by showing you guys some of the gear that I use to take pictures underwater. And then we'll go in and look at some photos and stories and learn some tips for storytelling today. So the first thing we need to take pictures underwater is a camera, right? So underwater, we use the same type of camera as you would above water. So this is just a regular camera, DSLR. You can see the screen on the back. Looks like a regular camera, uh, but this is not waterproof. So we have to take and put it in what's called a housing. And so that housing is just a fancy word for a waterproof box, basically, which looks like this. So this is a waterproof box that the camera has to go in. And you can see the part in the front that's glass is called a dome. And that's where the camera points through. So if we set this up here and then go ahead and this camera fits right in here, right into this slot. Then it gets locked into place. And then we take and put a piece on the back 
to make sure it's completely watertight. And this is the piece here. You can see all of these fancy buttons inside and those all go with buttons on the back of the camera. We put it on, clip it into place, and then you can see that the camera is now in there. You can see the lens sticking out of the dome in the front. And this is how I'm taking the pictures underwater that we'll see in a minute. And it's pretty heavy. It weighs like, that probably weighs like 15 or 20 pounds. And then this is a strobe, which is just another fancy word for an underwater light. And this is how we would add light to our pictures underwater. And this is how it attaches to the camera. And then on the back, you can actually, I know you probably can't see these numbers, but you can turn it on and you can adjust the power of the light, just basically how bright it is. And then the batteries go in back here that you have to recharge every time you want to use it. So those are some of the tools that I use. And now I want to show you guys some photos. So let's see if sharing my desktop works. How are we looking? Can you see a picture of me in the water? Yep, looking good, Jenny. Awesome, great. So you might be wondering what exactly it means to be a photojournalist. And so you just saw the gear that we need to use to shoot these photos, but what does that mean? So sometimes it means swimming with manatees. This is me in a Florida spring, um, and I am turning the camera on here to take a selfie because this manatee kept swimming so close to me that I had to turn the camera around. So what I do is I tell stories about science and conservation that happen beneath the surface. So beyond just taking photos of wildlife, I document the impacts that climate change and humans have on wildlife and their habitats. And I also document the people who are working to do research and conservation work to save these places and understand them better. So I live in Florida. So this means that the manatees come up into the freshwater springs in the winter. And they do this because they need to stay warm and they actually don't have a blubber layer like whales and dolphins. So they have to stay in water it's 72 degrees Fahrenheit or warmer in order to be okay in the winter. And if you look really closely here and you look at the manatee's flipper, how it's kind of scratching its nose there, you can see three little things that look kind of like toenails on there. And I want you to think for a second about what animal that might remind you of. So if you guessed elephant, you're correct. And the closest living relative to Cyrenians, which includes manatees, um, are elephants. And so these manatees are also really incredible because they eat, they're vegetarians and they rely on a lot of grass from the springs and they can eat about 10% of their body weight a day, which can be about a hundred pounds of grass every day. So imagine if you had to eat that much salad every day, it'd be pretty crazy. So I have a lot of stories about manatees, but I wanna switch gears and share um, another story with you today that's about sponges. And it will take us all the way to the equator. And um, I'm gonna share some keys to telling powerful stories along the way. So what do you first think of when you hear sponge? You might be a lot less excited about it than you are about manatees, but they're actually pretty cool. This is what comes up when you do a Google search for sponge. Um, and you probably have one in the kitchen sink or maybe your parents use one to clean the house or maybe you help with that. Um, so uh, maybe you think of this sponge. Uh, this is actually getting a lot closer to what we're talking about because we're talking about sponges that live in the ocean, not the sponge that might be in your kitchen sink. So let's take a, a quick survey here amongst your thing. Um, Jenny, it looks like your connection is going in and out. If you want to ask the question again, we'll see if we can get a better connection. Fungus. Yeah, yeah. Can you turn your Wi-Fi off? Okay. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if you can hear me anymore. Um, so we're looking I can at hear you now, Jenny. You can? Okay, cool. So if a sponge is a plant, an animal, or a fungus. And so I'm going to give it away. Um, it is an animal. So I know it doesn't really look like an animal, but it's actually an aquatic invertebrate like a coral. 
So this is a natural sponge um, growing off the coast of East Africa. And unlike corals, sponges can actually live in freshwater and estuaries, and they're really diverse. There are more than 8,000 species of sponges, and some date back to about 600 million years ago. So they're really old. And some can live in tide pools and others live over 8,000 meters deep. So they're really diverse and really cool. This is what a piece of a sponge looks like. It was grown in uh, off the east coast of Zanzibar on a sponge farm. And here I'm holding it and squeezing all the water out of it. We had just harvested it out of um, the sponge nursery. So if you heard me say Zanzibar and have no idea what that is, that's okay. It is an island right off of the east coast of Tanzania in Africa. So we're zooming in here and you can see that the red dot on this Google map is in Jambiani, which is where these women who farm sponges live. And it's just barely south of the equator. And I was just there in February. So it was, it was summer since their seasons are opposite. This is what it looks like off the coast. Uh, these are really big tides and the women can only access their sponge farms where they're growing them off, um, off the beach at a new moon, new or full moon when the tides are really extreme. So you'll have higher and lower, so bigger extreme tides during certain cycles of the moon. And they have to wait for this in order to go out and get their sponges. And along the way, you have to be really careful because there's, there are these huge sea urchins in the sand that um, will hurt, can hurt your feet. So the water gets pretty a little bit deeper as they walk out to the farms. And what's really amazing is that women here didn't don't know how really know how to swim. And so none of them could swim before they started farming sponges. And um, the island is 99% Muslim. So they always cover up their arms and their heads, um, their legs, and they actually learn to swim with all these clothes on too, which I think is just so amazing. And they're they're really strong and um, incredible women. So they're really inspirational also because they learn to farm sponges while learning to swim. And this here is Nasiri, who used to be a seaweed farmer for about 10 years. Um, and now she farms sponges. And she was one of the first two sponge farmers on the island. And it's way more profitable for them to grow sponges than it is for them to grow seaweed. And it's also um, more reliable because the seaweed crop that they're harvesting isn't necessarily as profitable now with climate change and a lot of diseases that it's causing with the warmer waters. This is what the farm looks like underwater. So they have ropes with all the sponges attached with clear line. And most of the women, when they see them walking out, these there's 11 women on the island that farm sponges. When they see them walking out, they're scared for them because they're scared of the deep water. So these women are incredibly brave. Here is one of them cleaning uh, the line and tying another sponge on. And then you might be wondering where all of these pieces of sponges come from. And a sponge will actually grow just from another piece of the sponge. So if you cut some of it off, it will grow. So what they do is they have a, what's called a sponge nursery. And so nurseries are what, where babies go, right? So the pieces of sponge that are gonna grow into other sponges are housed in the nursery. And this is what it looks like and it's in a little bit of deeper water and this allows them to not harvest sponges from the wild because in a lot of other countries people have harvested too many wild sponges that grow on the ground like the picture that I showed you at the beginning and that can kill off all of the sponge populations. So this is what it looks like to swim through the sponge nursery and there are about 20,000 sponges in the sponge nursery. And you can see a diver up there that is making sure they're attached right and doing maintenance on the nursery. And those noises are just the bubbles from my exhale when I'm, when I'm scuba diving. So even if the story focuses on, so I'm communicating science in the story about these sponges, it's, they're actually still stories about people because a crucial part of storytelling is connecting because people, like we like to connect with other humans. So even though it's a story about sponges, this is also a story about the incredible women who farm the sponges. And we want readers and viewers to connect with these women and see how extraordinary it is what they're doing. Um, so even if you live in the United States and you might be working on a story in another country, um, you can connect and find common ground with people all over the world. And so a really important element in telling a good story and something that I had to do when I went over to Zanzibar 
is build trust and it's not automatic. You know, you might have friends that you trust or you trust your family. And if you go meet someone new, you might not automatically trust them. So you have to spend a lot of time with people like I am here in this photo. We have to spend a lot of time above all. Well, Jenny, it looks like we lost you for a second. If you can hear me, you can start again about building Law, trust. Help. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Let's see if we can get Jenny back. You're frozen for a second. Let's see. Can you hear me, Jenny? All right. Looks like we may have lost Jenny. Thanks. One second. We'll see if we can get her back. Let's All right. I can hear her again. Okay. Can, can you hear me, see Jenny? Me? <laughs> yeah, I'm still here. Okay, great. Yeah. If we were about halfway through this slide, I think, when we lost you. If you can start from there. Okay, sure. So, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so even if you work in the US and you might be telling a story in another country, you can still build trust with people all over the world. And this is incredibly important in order to tell a good story. And it takes time. And so you can see I'm spending time with these women here above water so that they trust me and understand what I'm doing and why I might be there to help tell their story. So you can see here, this is Nasiri and she's in her home in Jamiani. She is one of the sponge farmers. Um, and, oh, excuse me, this is Shamisa. And uh, we had to build enough trust with her in order to let her, have her let us into her home. And so that was really big. And so the point of that is to really get access to people and be able to take photos and tell stories that maybe are a little bit hidden beneath the surface. And it's also important, what we're doing here is that we are um, giving her a voice in her own story. So when you go in to shoot a story somewhere, make sure you get the perspective of the local people and don't go in with too much of an idea of what you think the story is, especially if you're not from there and you need to really be a good listener in order to be a good storyteller. So also you need to be really respectful. This is uh, me when I was working with the sponge farmers. And like I said, it's a mostly Muslim country and it just shows respect um, and shows that you understand um, their religion and their beliefs and um, by covering your head. And so I covered my head when I was interviewing and when I was above water with these women. And you should also learn to say a few words in the local language. So here they, in Jambiani, they spoke Swahili and I like to learn how to say hello and thank you and words like that, that show that you care and that you're invested in the story. And this is, um, you say caribou, which means welcome. And if you wanna say thank you, you say asante or thank you very much is asante sana. And so those are some words that you can learn if you ever end up in a Swahili speaking country. One other thing that's really important is sharing. So even if you don't speak the same language, sharing photos helps. And so I'm showing the Siri, the photos I took of her on the sponge farm so that she understands what I've been doing with the camera um, with her. So you can see there, she's laughing. We, we I speak English and speak, she speaks Swahili. We don't speak the same language, but by certain body gestures or by smiling and learning a few words, it can make a huge difference. And one other thing that's important in the work that I do and that I work of a lot of storytellers is to really try to figure out and understand how your work can have an impact in the community or area that you're working. So can your story help with local laws, with conservation or protection of a species? Can it improve the lives of the people who live there? Um, and can you help the people there in some way? Because they have so generously given you their time um, in order to teach you about what they're doing, like these women did with the sponges. And here they have harvested them and they're cleaning them in a special soap that they actually make with the nut from a local tree. And so they can create this soap just with the things that they have on hand. And then they'll go and sell these sponges at local shops and hotels. And they sell for about $20 each, uh, mostly to tourists. And you use them just like you would a regular sponge. So you could use it in the shower or for caring for a baby um, or something like that. So I'm actually originally trained as a scientist and I just wanted to share this because after I did my PhD, I felt like I had sort of quit science when I went into conservation photography and doing photojournalism. 
but communication is actually an essential part of science. And so you shouldn't feel bad if you um, want to do something more creative. And so my advice to anyone, any of you who want to go into science and technology and math um, is don't limit yourself to career possibilities that people tell you are possible or, or don't try to follow in someone else's exact path. Um, your unique skill set and things that you're really passionate about will lead you kind of on your own journey. And so don't tell people or listen to people who tell you it's not possible because a lot of people told me it wasn't possible to be an underwater photographer. So also to tell stories that have an impact, you don't need to travel to the other side of the world. So if you want to become a photographer and you want to start telling stories, don't think that you have to travel halfway across the world to Africa or to Iceland or to a really a place that seems very far from home. A lot of the most powerful and interesting stories you'll tell are right here in your backyard and in your local community. And I wanted to give this example and a shout out to Lucy and Marin and Owen who are all uh, watching right now. And this is Lucy here um, who is swimming in a kelp forest on the sidewalk right outside of our house. Uh, we share a backyard and during all of the coronavirus stuff going on right now while we're at home, I've been shooting stories in the backyard. So you really don't have to travel um, very far. And I encourage you to get out into your backyard if you're safe and able to do that right now and just start taking pictures and exploring and um, keeping connected to nature and um, telling stories from your perspective because your perspective matters and it's important. So that's all that I've got for you now. And I hope that you could hear me during the last bit and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Anit. That was amazing. I love how you ended it. And I want to go make a kelp forest on my driveway now. I think that sounds like an excellent way to spend the rest of the day. Yes. Um, for folks learning along at home, we'd love to see what you're doing with this. If you do a follow-up activity from the family guide or educator guide, or maybe you make a kelp forest on your own driveway, uh, maybe draw a picture or write a story or make a video, please send those to us by tagging at Nat Geo Education and using hashtag Explore Classroom on Twitter. That way we can make sure Jenny gets a chance to see all of your amazing work. All right, so now it's time for questions. If you're watching online, send us your questions in the chat bar. We record them all as they're sent in, so you just need to send those questions in once. And if you're on screen, get ready with a nice loud voice, and I'll call on you when it's your turn. Uh, so I'm going to start off with an easy one, and then we'll go to one of our on-screen participants. Um, a couple people in the chat bar I noticed were wondering, what, what do sea sponges feel like? Do they just feel like regular sponges? Oh, kind of. Here, let me go grab one, actually. I have one right here. Oh, perfect. I have to say, Jenny, you have the, the most in-depth show and tell out of any of our explorers so far, I think. <laughs> well, this one I actually just took out of the shower. Um, <laughs> So <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it's a natural sea sponge. It's really squishy. It feels like a regular sponge, but it has sort of more, as you can see, it has more pores there um, in it than a regular sponge might. Um, and so, yeah, it's really squishy. And the interesting thing is when it gets dry, it gets really hard and you can actually destroy it by crushing it when it's dry. So if, if you do have a natural sponge, you need to make sure that you um, get it wet before you squish it, but it can get really small and it kind of pops right back up. It's pretty cool. Awesome. All right, we're gonna go to our on screen uh, participants, the Pizer family. So I believe this is Alex, Vivian, Ava, and Julia. Do either of you, any of you have a question? Um, well, I was wondering like, how long have you been on, like what's the longest you've been underwater to take a photo or a video? Oh, wow, good question. Oh, that's a great question. So it really depends um, if I'm free diving, so holding my breath, um, where you just would wear this mask and snorkel and you just take one breath and then dive down. Um, and that's only lasts for a few minutes. Or if you're on scuba, so if you actually have a scuba tank and a regulator, which is like the fancy mouthpiece that goes in your mouth to breathe air off the back of your, uh, out of your tank, um, that depends on the depth of water that you're in. So if you're at say, you know, 60 feet you can stay for a lot longer than you when you're at like 100 feet because of how the air gets compressed underwater so i don't know what the actual longest is i've been underwater for but if i'm going for a cave dive or something and you have two tanks with you you can be under there for a few hours exploring the different cave passageways which is pretty fun oh, wow that's awesome um so some more sponge related questions coming in online and a popular one is what do sponges eat 
oh, what do sponges eat? That's a great question. Um, so sponges like filter stuff out of the water. So I don't know exactly what they eat. That's a really good question, but yeah, they'll filter. That's what these pores are for. It kind of like the water goes in and then they can grab little particles from the water um, as it goes in and then it kind of gets like ejected out. So I'll have to look that up. That's a good question. Very cool though. All right, uh, Elena and Audrey, I'm gonna come to you guys for a question. I unmuted you. Do you have a question for Jenny? Say yes. What's your question? What's the coolest thing you've seen underwater? Ooh, that's a good question. The coolest thing. Oh man, there's been so many cool things. I think the coolest thing that I've seen is a whale shark. Um, so there, there are these huge animals that live underwater. They're like the size of a school bus. They're really long and they have um, like these really cool patterns on them. So it's blue and then it has these kind of whitish dots and spots all over it. And scientists can actually identify individual whale sharks by sort of like your fingerprint. Um, they can tell which, which one is which to be able to follow them. Um, so that's probably the coolest thing. And they have these huge mouths and they filter feed. So they come up to the surface and open their mouth is like, I can't even make how big their mouth is, but they kind of suck the water in a surface to filter out um, like the phytoplankton that's in the water and other fish. Very cool. Um, question coming in online on the on the chat bar is how do you decide what to photograph when you're out? That's a great question. So it looks kind of like I spent all my time in the water and I really wish that I did because that would be really ideal. But when I before I get in the water, there's months and months or sometimes even a year of research and applying for grants so that you can have funding to go to the these places and connecting with people. Um, it's again sort of that building of trust. And so the original idea for a story might come from reading a scientific paper or talking with friends who are scientists or um, talking to other conservationists or staying up with the news. But then when um, I actually go to put that idea into action and go to actually photograph a story, it requires a lot of email and reading and um, all the things that are a little bit less fun, but they make for more. Oh no, Jenny, we lost you right at the end of that question. All right, one second. Let me see if I can give you some more bandwidth. But we lost you right after you had said uh, the things that are a little less fun. Let's see if we can get oh. Jenny back. When did I? You had talked about sending emails and setting things up, things that were a little bit less fun. <laughs> so and then we lost. Do, I guess. <laughs> okay, can you? Okay. Coming in and so out. I guess the point of that story. Okay, let's see. I think you're yeah. Good. Okay, good. Yeah. Cool. So after you do sort of all of the less fun stuff, um, which I think I still think is really interesting because you are reading and learning a ton about the topic. Like you want to be the expert sort of on the certain species or the topic that you are going to photograph and make as many connections as you can so that when you get out into the field to start shooting, you're at the right place at the right time with the right people and you've done all this work to get that right. So yeah, it's a lot of research, um, which, which is fun um, so that it makes the in-water time a lot more productive and you can make a good story out of it. Awesome, good, always a good to plug for people to plan, I think. So, yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> all right. We have some of our on screen uh, participants, Aria and Layla. I'm going to unmute you if you have a question for Jenny. Let me see. All right. Go ahead and ask it nice and loud. What was the hardest video that you took? The hardest yes. one. Oh, that's a good, that's a good question. The hardest um, videos, the sort of a combination between photos and videos was um, taking pictures in Florida caves. So there are these underwater caves in Florida where I live um, that are called the, it's part of the aquifer. And it's, so it's fresh water that's underground. And to get into these caves, you put on all of this, um, this big dive gear and you dive in, and it's completely dark in there. And there are these passageways that you swim through underwater, um, these winding passageways. And I had to bring my camera in there to take pictures. And um, it was really hard because there's a lot of water, like a lot of current. If you think about it, if you're swimming at the beach and there's a current that washes you away, there's water that's flowing out. And so it's trying to push you out of the cave. And if you have a big camera and you're trying not to break this big fancy glass dome here, if, if this part of the camera hits a rock, it can break it. 
So you have to be really careful um, in there to make sure that you're not breaking it. And you also have to be really careful about your own safety. So when I'm in the caves, I'm making sure that I'm okay, um, which takes up you know, some of your brain space. And then also make sure that you're getting good photos along the way. And so that's the most challenging part for me is shooting in underwater caves. Wow, that sounds crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a lot of fun. That probably was a little bit dramatic. <laughs> um, well, back kind of on the subject of cameras, we have coming in on the chat, people asking uh, a bit more about your camera. Is it the same kind of camera that you would use on land or is it different? And if so, how so? Yeah, so it's the exact same camera. Um, so it's just this housing is what's required to keep it waterproof. And then on the inside, if we open up the back of this housing, and take the camera out. I could just take this camera out and walk over to my neighbor's house and start taking pictures. So it's just a regular camera that's hiding in there um, in the back. And you can actually also change the lens on this too. So if I wanted to, usually I use this lens above water. It has a little bit more zoom because you don't really zoom underwater. You have to just get up close to stuff underwater um, and try to, because that would, if you zoom, it makes some, um, it doesn't look as good because of like the particles in the water. And so that's one challenging thing about underwater photography is getting as, as close as you can. Awesome, thanks for taking that out to show us. It's super cool. Yeah, thanks. Um, so we have a lot of really great questions coming in online on the chat bar, so keep them coming. Um, two that I'm gonna kind of tie together. Someone asked, how long does it take to build trust with the people that you're going to tell stories about? And then afterwards, do you keep in contact with them at all? Oh, that's, that's so great. I love that. Um, so building the trust, it depends. I think sometimes it depends on if there's a language barrier and whether the people you're photographing have had other people photograph them before and sort of how, how I guess, how you carry yourself and how you approach them. Um, so with the woman from Zanzibar, I got in touch with the director um, of a nonprofit called Marine Cultures. And his name is Christian, and he was able to get me in contact with them because they're, they're hard to get in contact with, right? Like they don't all have cell phones and stuff like that. So I spent a lot of time getting um, in contact with him and asking him a lot of questions like, um, uh, would they be okay with me having a camera and coming and being not from there and everything? Um, so that took a while. And then once I got there, because he trusted me, the woman then trusted me, and he was able to introduce me to them because he could speak Swahili and English. So I think it does really depend on the situation, but um, I always think the longer the better because um, a lot of assignments won't give you that much time. This was one a project that I pitched and kind of went and shot on my own and got grants for afterwards, uh, which is not always how it works. Um, so it kind of depends too. And so I had a lot of extra, um, extra time to kind of meet these women and um, spend time getting to know them. But I think that um, overall it shows in your images afterwards if you're able to connect with people um, versus just going in and shooting for a day or two and coming out. And then afterwards, I definitely stay in touch with people. Um, I have stayed in touch with basically all the people that I've photographed and had made some really good friends. And it's a really cool way to make friends all over the world and just find like these incredible people that you never would have otherwise met. So yeah, I love it. That's really awesome. Thanks for sharing with that with us. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna go to our uh, on-screen participants. So Mila and Ben, I'm gonna unmute your mic. One second, let's see. All right, you're unmuted. Go ahead and ask your question nice and loud for Jenny. So how big is the biggest sea sponge you found underwater? Oh, good well, question. <laughs> that's great. Um, some of them, so when they harvest them, they're about this big. Um, but if you just let it grow on the line, um, some of them, they were probably like this big, so like quite a bit bigger, and then they would cut a piece off, so you could just cut like this little piece off here, and it would grow into a big sponge. So they cut them before they get too big, but realistically, it would keep getting bigger and bigger, because if you look at wild sponges, some wild sponges are like the barrel sponges. They have a top that's like, you know, this big, it's huge, and then they can be really tall. And so they come in all different shapes and sizes, which is really neat. But when they're growing them, they keep them kind of small. But yeah, some sponges in the wild are massive and some people confuse it with corals too. Do you have a question? Awesome. All right, so we have another question from online and it's, what is your favorite place that you've been? Oh, uh, so my favorite place that I've been and the country where I've spent the most time and outside of the US is Iceland. 
And last summer I was there on a Nat Geo Expeditions trip um, and we, oh, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here, sorry. <laughs> no, no, you're good, I thought I froze. Um, and so I was on a ship for about a month going around Iceland twice, so it's an island, um, so you can go all the way around it. Um, and then I spent some time in Vestvenir and I made some really awesome friends and hung out with some puff people who study puffins. And so this island, um, the reason why it's my favorite is because baby puffins, which are called pufflings, which are these little small, um, ridiculously cute birds come and they get stranded in the streets there because Bessemer is the only inhabited island um, in the, or Heime is the only um, inhabited island in the Westman Islands in Iceland. And so the people go out all night and collect these baby puffins, put them in boxes and then release them by throwing them off cliffs the next day. And <laughs> the community there was just so welcoming and wonderful. And um, yeah, I hope to go back again this year. The season is um, in September, uh, like August, September. But if, if we can travel by then, it would be cool to, to go back. Um, so, yeah. That sounds awesome. Puffins are super cute and baby puffins sound even cuter, just their name. Um, <laughs> all right, let's go to some of our on-screen students, the Pizer family. I'm going to unmute you guys. If you have another question for Jenny, ask away. Um, yeah, I wanted to know what determines the color of a sponge. Oh, I do not know the answer to that. That's a very good question. Um, apparently I need to read up more on sponges to be more of an expert on sponges because <laughs> there are so many colors of sponges. Like some kind of sponges are the color like purple of that drape behind you. Like they could be the color of your wall. They can be, so So this color here is not actually, these sponges look um, more green underwater. So if you remember the video of me squeezing it, um, like as it dies, like there's algae and stuff that would be in there that then um, get squeezed out. So the sponges aren't really usually tan like that underwater, which is kind of interesting. I'm gonna have to post all these answers online once I look them up. <laughs> Very cool. Pfizer family, do you have any other questions while I have you up here? Um, uh, how long does a sponge take to grow? Ooh, good one. So these sponges, um, to get to about this size from a small piece, um, a lot of the sponges that are in there the women's farms are in there for about a year um, to get to a size where they um, they can sell them. But along the way, um, they're actually like sculpting the sponge to make the right shape. And so every time they go out to their farm, they're like kind of curving off some of the edges to make a nice round shape. So those sponges um, would grow for about a year before they harvest them. And the sponges in the sponge nursery where they're continually cutting pieces off, some of those sponges have been in that nursery for seven years. But as long as you keep cutting pieces off, they kind of stay like a, like, you know, a constant size. Um, and so it's a lot of work that goes into maintaining, um, maintaining those and making sure the sponges grow right and kind of learning the art of how to trim a sponge, I guess. <laughs> Very cool. Um, a really great question that came in online. We know you have background uh, in science and you have your PhD, but do you have any professional training in underwater photography and how exactly did, did you learn how to do underwater photography? Yes, so really, I, I did not go to school for photography, um, but I worked as a scientist. And then for a year after I worked as a biologist for the US Geological Survey, and after that, I worked for a small video and production company in Florida and learned a lot from that. So sort of on the job training, like as a mentorship um, from this awesome guy named David. Uh, and so I learned a lot from that. And then other than that, after I sort of learned some of the basics of photography and shooting underwater, I spent hours and hours and months and years just practicing and, you know, reading everything I could about photography and um, you know, really just getting out with my camera and taking a lot of pictures. And at first they're really pretty bad. So don't be discouraged if, you know, they're not great at first um, or if you don't have the fanciest camera or anything like that, because I didn't start out with that. And um, so a lot of my training, even though it wasn't in journalism and during my PhD, it took a lot of, um, or it wasn't in photojournalism, I took a lot of regular journalism courses. And so I learned about the journalism aspect of photojournalism, which is important for learning how to, to tell stories and do interviews and, um, and that piece, that piece of it. So yeah, don't be discouraged if you, you know, don't take the right classes or think you're not doing the right, you know, training because you can, you can practice and you can learn um, online and learn from friends. And um, a lot of people are really generous with their knowledge too, which is cool. Awesome. What a great answer. 
All right, we're gonna go to another student, some students on, on screen. We have Aria and Layla. I'm gonna unmute your mic. If you have a question for Jenny, ask it nice and loud. Why do you hope to teach people with your work? Oh, good question. So a lot of my work uh, focuses on women who work in science and conservation. So a big message is to inspire the next generation like you guys to go out and maybe do science and conservation and have those jobs because a lot of times when we look in the media like in newspapers and online you might see stories about or photos of men who are doing the work and if you can't see yourself doing that or you can't see people that look like you doing that then that's not really that inspiring, is it, right? So a lot of the stories that I tell are to inspire other women um, to go into to science and conservation. Um, but also another thing is because most of my work happens underwater, I wanna inspire people to protect and care for the ocean and our fresh water and understand how you know things that you might do every day could impact these ecosystems and these places that maybe are usually hidden out of sight. So I wanna give people a lens into those places underwater. Awesome, great, another great answer from Jenny. Okay. Um, couple questions, one I'm gonna do real quick that came in online is what do sea cows eat? Do you know? Oh, sea cows. Yeah, so the manatees, um, that's just like a funny thing that people in Florida call manatees. Um, they eat grasses and so they're they're just vegetarians. And so they're the ones that can eat, you know, up to, you know, about a hundred pounds of grass every day. So in the springs, they'll kind of eat any vegetation, um, but they really like some of the native grasses, which are called Sagittaria and Balsanaria. And if you watch them, they look like lawnmowers. Like they just go in and keep eating and eating and eating. Um, some scientists tried to build exclusion devices to keep them out of, um, like keep them out of the areas where they wanted grass to grow. And there's a video of a manatee bending like metal poles to get through, like a metal cage to get through to the vegetation. So they're quite persistent in their eating habits. <laughs> Very cool. Sounds like a lot of us probably right now stuck at our homes. I know yes, I, exactly. <laughs> I'm eating just like a sea cow. Yep. <laughs> um, another question came in online. I just want to know a little bit more about the, the lighting tool you have, your strobe, I believe, and how exactly okay. that works. Yeah, sure. So, so there are two of them, one that goes on each side of the camera. And um, when you turn it on, um, and attach it to the camera with this piece. It, this is how it talks to the camera basically. And so you turn it on and adjust the, when you turn it on a uh, green light comes on so that you know that um, and it starts making all these like hissing noises. Um, and so above water, if you use it, it can get pretty hot. So under it's best to use it underwater. Um, and then when you take a picture, when you use, when you press the, um, the, Oh, we lost like, you for a second, right when you were gonna show us what happens when you press the button. <laughs> Let's see if we can get Jenny back. All right. Oh no. Whatever power you. Oh, I hear her again. <laughs> Am I coming back? <laughs> yep, now we've got you back. Okay, All right, cool. it was so <laughs> right when you said when you press the button. <laughs> So you press a button and it, the, so because the camera is connected to the strobe with this cord here, it tells the strobe, okay, ready, go. And it fires at the power that you've set it to. So you could set it if it was really bright out and you just wanted to fill a little bit of, um, there's a shadow on something that you're photographing, you can set it to shoot like a, just a little bit of light or if it's really dark and you're really trying to illuminate something, you can set it to shoot really, Right. Um, and so, yeah, you could really play around with light and light can have a huge influence on, you know, what the outcome of your picture is. And the other thing that I use underwater um, are you can use strobes or LED lights. So strobes just like it's like a flash. It just flashes and then goes off. But an LED light that you would use for video is constant source of light. And I used a lot of those in cave photography because unlike this, where you attach these to your camera housing on, in caves, you actually take the um, lights off of your camera and put them out. So you can set up lights and sort of use light to almost paint kind of the cave passageways. And so there can be up to like 12 lights in one photo. And those of course are not all attached to your camera. So um, there's a lot that goes into lighting um, besides just the strobes that are on your camera. Awesome. All right, we have one more question from our on-screen participants, Elena and Audrey, I'm unmuting your mic if you have one last question for Jenny. What are you, what are you scared on the water? 
that's a good question. Um, so, no. Oh no, wait one second, Jenny. I muted you by mistake. Do you wanna watch? watch, watch you? All right, Jenny, go ahead. Okay, yeah, so I'm not afraid underwater, um, but I would kind of rather be above water, I mean, underwater than above water most of the time, to be honest. Um, but the reason why I'm not afraid is because I, understand what the threats are. So that's a really good question because a lot of people might be afraid of things like sharks or jellyfish or whatever. And so it's important to study the creatures and different things that live in the places where you might be swimming so that you don't accidentally get stung by a jellyfish or that you don't do something that you know scares an animal because you're kind of in their house when you're out there. Um, and so you might want to think about how you interact with them and sort of the vibe that you're giving off when, you, when you're swimming around um, and maybe don't step on the corals because that could actually hurt too. Um, so no, I think being underwater is really peaceful and it's a nice escape from um, a lot of the stuff above water. And um, yeah, if you would like to snorkel or get into diving, you should totally do it. I don't know where you live, but. <laughs> awesome. All right, Jenny, one last question. You've given us, our young explorers a ton of great advice today. Do you have any last advice for them though? Um, I guess just don't give up. And if there's something that you really love to do, um, keep doing it, um, keep reading, keep learning. Um, and if you wanna do photography, don't, like I said, be discouraged when your photos are not good at the beginning because they probably won't be. And um, that's not a reason to stop. And um, even today now, like I look at pictures I took a couple months ago and I'm like, ooh, what was I doing? And so I think you never stop learning. And um, that's one of the things that I love most about, about what I do, so. Awesome. I think that is a great note to end on. Uh, check out Explore Classroom and many, many more educational resources at natgeoed.org. We hope to see you at our next events. Tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Eastern, we're going to be talking to Annette Faya about seabirds. And at 2 p.m., we're learning about space with Julia De Marinas. All right, students on screen, I'm going to turn on all of your microphones so you can give Jenny a nice big thank you and goodbye. And hopefully we'll see you all again soon. All right, guys, can you say bye and thank you? Bye. Bye.